But Revelation 5, we're going to start in verse 7. This is where Jesus now, he takes the book. Uh, he came, in verse 7, took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And this is a big event. This is a big deal. Now, this is the Father giving to the Son everything. Everything. All things is the way the Bible puts it. Jesus knew that the Father had given him all things. And so, God here is giving his Son his power, his authority, his, um, his seat. Those three things are exactly what the dragon gives to the Antichrist in Revelation 13. The dragon gave him, the beast, his power, his seat, and great authority. So you see the, the contrast. God is here giving his son the book of everything and says, it's yours. The dragon, the devil, does the same thing to the Antichrist, whatever authority he has, he's going to give it. Remember, the devil does have an authority. And he offered that to Christ after the 40 days of his fasting in the wilderness. He said, showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and he said, I'll give you these if you'll bow before me. And of course, no, he wouldn't do it. Jesus is going to get them anyway. Amen? And when he takes the book, he's got him. He's got him. All right. In verse eight, and when he had taken the book, this is what happens. The four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints or prayers of saints. Uh, Ezra who was, the, the Bible calls him a ready, ready scribe before the Lord. When the Israelites came back from their 70 years being in captivity in Babylon, many of them, most of them, had never heard the, the, the word of God. They had never heard the law. They'd never had it read to them. They didn't know what it was in it. But their, their heart at this time was, we want to get back to what our forefathers knew. We want to know what our, grand, what our grandparents and our great-grandparents knew. We want to hear the word of God. So they assembled in one day, and the Bible says that Ezra stood up before them behind a pulpit of wood, and he took the book and opened it in their presence. When he opened it, he hadn't even read it yet. He opened the book, and all of the Israelites there who were there on that day stood up and gave their reverence to that book, not to Ezra, to the book, the word of God that was about. And before, before he even reads it, they're saying, amen, amen. These people want revival, amen. And that's what will happen. When you're ready for revival and God knows it, you know what he'll do for you? He'll open up the book for you. He will open the book for you and it will change your life. It did mine. Um, verse 9. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That's the Bible way of saying a lot of them. It's like that verse... Uh, that I use when I teach about UFOs is and, and I found out somebody sent this to me I did not know this but the King James is the only Bible that says it this way 
It says in the book of Psalms that the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. Which means at least 20,000 and thousands more. So there's at least 20,000 and thousands and thousands and thousands more. It's a sort of a... I don't want to say incomplete number. It's an open number. Okay? But uh, the King James is the only one that identifies the chariots of God as angels. The other English translations botched that verse. They messed it up so you get none of that understanding out of it. You have no understanding whatsoever. And, I, and why is this important? You have to... You have to have heard what I've heard, read what I've read, and know what I know about the whole UFO crowd. And I warned, I warned the lady that I did the interview with Friday. She said that their film company was going to go to Roswell, New Mexico, first weekend of July because they're having a UFO convention. And I said, I want to warn you, you're going to run into some weird, wacky people there. Trust me. I said, you're going to run into some fruitcakes there that are going to try to feel your aura. And she laughed at that. She thought that was funny. And it's true. Um, so, and that's one of the reasons why I chose the MUFON symposium to go to. It's a little bit more level-minded, I guess. More science-minded. But here's, here's what I'm getting back to. The whole UFO crowd says this. That on the day that the world is made aware of the fact that there is extraterrestrial life and it makes its presence known here on this earth, it will change and destroy every religion in the world. It will destroy man's religion. I agree with that, ex with that statement with one exception. It cannot destroy the religion of those who believe this Bible. That's why it's written the way it's written. The words, mean, the, the words matter. And those who have put their faith and their trust and their confidence in this Bible... They will not be deceived when that day happens. And that day is going to happen. Did you know what Congress did last week? Did you see the news? What happened, Chris? Well, they're, they're opening up discussions now on UFOs that are happening. Congress. Yeah, yeah. The United States Congress yeah. had a committee with, uh, oh, who was that idiot from California? Huh? All of them. Huh? <laughs> Um, but they're, they're, they're talking now and they're saying, and they showed the, the pictures that have been released and some of them have, were, were, um, classified images that were snuck out by somebody in the Navy or whatever. And they were published, made public. And they showed those pictures and they said, these are actual photographs of ships that are not ours and we know they're not the russians and we know that the chinese don't have anything like that so we know they didn't come from here and beyond that we don't have an answer of where they came from but those those images are real and um i said i said this in up in indiana a couple weeks ago i said if if you don't believe in this it is it is irrelevant now it is irrelevant if you don't believe in this because it's true and it's going to be seen more and more and more in our lifetime. And if you don't hold on to this book, you will fall. You will fail. Um, back, back to the scriptures. Um, verse 12. We have the 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive. And there's, 
Let's count these. To receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. How many? Seven things. That's perfection. This is, and how many seals does the book have on it? Seven. So think, th apply this now. This book that has been given to Jesus Christ, those seals, let's say those seals represent, number one, power. Number two, riches. Number three, wisdom. Number four, strength. Number five, honor. Uh, I missed one here. Let me see. Power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor. Yeah, and glory and blessing. Jesus has now received all of those in the form of that book. So I would say to you this morning, who in here wants wisdom? If you want wisdom, it's in this book. Ask God to open it up for you and show you wisdom. Who in here uh, needs strength to carry on? Ask God to open this book for you. There's strength in this book. And you can just, the riches, but not the wealth, not, not filthy lucre. There are riches that money cannot buy. Amen? Uh, glory and blessing. Who wants to be blessed? The blessings are in the book. Ask God to open this book up for you and bless you. So, in verse 13, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth, and think about what he's saying now. Every creature which is in heaven and every creature that is on the earth and every creature that is under the earth. Think about that for a minute. And such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power. Four things. Be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And just look at the pomp and circumstance that accompanies God giving his son this book. I mean, this, this was the biggest deal that heaven has ever seen. Um... I watched, I got curious one day, and I, I, I went to YouTube, and I watched the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. Now, that was before my time. More than likely, she's going to pass on here, who knows when. But she don't have much more time for this earth, and those of us now are going to see a coronation of a king in England. And buddy, this is not a five-minute situation here where they read some things and put the crown on and say, you're king. This is, the biggest of, this is the biggest of all things that happen in the United Kingdom. The coronation of a monarch in England. And Europe doesn't have very many kings left. World War II did away with a lot of them. But the United Kingdom still has a, still has a monarch. And when, when Prince Charles takes the throne, we're talking about the pomp and circumstance of all of England. Horses and chariots and military and guards and people dressed in regal clothing. And I mean, you're, you're going to see a spectacle when this happens. That's nothing compared to what you just read in Revelation 5 when Jesus takes that book. It is, a, it is the significant event in both heaven and earth because it, it is going to change everything. Now, Revelation 6. Now we're going to see what happens when the seals are open. Yes, Gary.
That's right. I was going to throw that in there because I was going to, I was going to say, think about what, what is under the earth. There's a story. Remember when Saul went to the woman of Endor who, who had a familiar spirit. She was a fortune teller. And Saul needed to talk to Samuel, who had died. And so she conjured up something. And then she realized that that was Saul in front of her because she believed that that familiar spirit that she saw was Samuel. And Saul asked her, what did you see? And she said, I saw God ascending out of the earth. Where were they? They were under the earth. They were, under, they were down there somewhere. Okay? I don't know what all kind of hills are down there, but they're down there. And she saw them ascending up. Well, guess what? You're right, Gary. Those devils, both in heaven and on earth and under the earth, they're going to have to bow their knee to Jesus Christ. Amen. They're going to have to bow their knee. Um, and I don't remember, but it, it seems like there's a part of that coronation of, the, of Queen Elizabeth where she, she, I don't know how to put it, she um, submits herself to the office of being queen. And then I think there's a, a part where the people are represented by people who say that they will give their obedience to, to Queen Elizabeth II. I, I may be wrong on that, may not be remembering it right, but I seem like that was part of it. That there was this thing where they had to bow to her and say, we will honor you as our queen. And not even her husband, not even her husband has authority over her. When Prince Philip was alive, it's, it's kind of funny. Every year she would open up parliament. And in this grand spectacle, the Queen of England would come in and sit in the House of Lords on a throne and give a little speech and begin the session of parliament. Well, Prince Philip sat next to her, but his chair was six inches lower than hers. I just thought that was interesting. And she has to be sitting higher than he does. Okay, Revelation 6. And when I saw the lamb opened one of the seals... I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, I have a book. Matthew Henry's commentary. I borrowed it from my mother when I went to Bible college and I've never returned it. Um, Matthew Henry wrote this several hundred years ago. He did this commentary of the Bible. Matthew Henry's belief was that this was Christ coming out on a white horse to take over the earth. Okay? That's what he believed. He believed that this was Jesus Christ. I don't. I don't believe that. Uh, Christ is later in Revelation 19. But what, there's an interesting thing that you'll see. A lot, Napole, Napoleon did it. Other people, dictators, monarchs, whatever, have done it, that have matched this symbolism where they will come in riding on a white horse to show that they are now the king. They are the emperor. They are the supreme grand ruler of all of their domain or whatever. But there are a lot of statues, especially, around Europe and, and maybe even in other places where some former national ruler is seen, you know, on a, on a horse or on a white horse or the horse is up on its hind legs or whatever. 
showing his authority. And notice this particular, this particular rider sitting on the white horse. He had a bow in his hand. Okay? Uh, the bow would symbolize warfare. Okay? You use, you use the arrows. The bow is what sends the arrows out. The bow represents his, his strength is military strength. He's going to use that bow to get his power. Um, and a crown was given unto him. So now he is being given the, uh, the authority to rule and to conquer the nations of the earth. Okay? Um, <clears throat> let me finish reading this and we'll, we'll try to get some wisdom from the Old Testament on this. In verse 3. When he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon. Notice the language. Power was given to him. Who, who gave him the power? God did. Here he's opening the seal. The second seal releases this second horse, this red horse, and his rider. There was power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. The sword represents, again, represents forced rulership. They rule by the edge of a sword. Those those who voted for Donald Trump to be president. Did somebody put a gun to your head to vote for him? No. All of the millions and millions of people that voted him to be the president. See, I'm not saying which one. Voted for him to be president was not forced at gunpoint to vote for him. And when he became president, there were millions of Americans that followed him and said, we'll, we'll give you respect, we'll pay you honor, we'll pay you. This bozo in the White House now, you would have to put a gun to my head and you'd have to shoot me. Right? Amen. This is forced rule and he takes peace from the earth remember what jesus said nation shall fight against nation kingdom against kingdom there's going to come a time when the fathers are going to be turned against their children and children against their fathers and there is going to be probably racial strife all throughout the world it won't be just in america it'll be everywhere there will be no peace on the earth. People will be fighting other nations. People will be fighting their own neighbors. They'll be fighting in their own families. And then verse 5. When he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. What, what are balances used for? measurements, okay? Uh, and I preached this here a while back. It's a good study. If you'll do it, it's a good study. Look at, look at scales and balances in the Bible. And, one, and God says this repeatedly, that he hates an unjust weight and an unjust balance. God hates it. And here's... Here's one analogy that I get from that. Most lost people who say they believe in God, if you ask them, how do you expect to get into heaven? 90%, what's their answer going to be? I believe my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. Well, they've got their thumb on the scale. See, that's a term that people used to show that somebody was cheating on the weight. They would have their thumb on the scale 
holding the scale down so that it looked like that what they were giving you was of greater value than what you were giving them. Okay? And it was a way to cheat people. And so we literally, I, I don't want to get into all this, but in, somewhere in Washington, D.C., under tight security, under glass in a vacuum, there are these little pieces of weights that are held there, and those are the official weights of the United States of America, and this is one gram, and this is 10 grams, and this is 100 grams, or whatever, and they have those official weights. The gas, you go down the gas station here, look for a sticker on the pump that shows you that the Department of, the Bureau of Weights and Measures has tested that pump. Rhonda Gonia told a story one time where he had a truck, it had two gas tanks on it, and he let, always let one gas tank run completely out. Then he'd switch over to the second gas tank. And so he knew how much gas went in that tank. And he was going to this station. And they were putting, let's say it was like an 18-gallon tank. Well, they were putting 23 gallons in it. Not possible, right? And he went in there and threw a fit at them. And they threw him out. He called the Department of Weights and Measures. They came out and examined that pump, and sure enough, they were cheating on that pump. Because he says, I know how much gas is in that tank because it runs out every time. There's 17 gallons in that. I know it every time. And he ended up paying 23 gallons for it. Anyway, bell ring. i got to move on. Um, if you will study Zechariah 6, Zechariah 6, that's your homework this week. Uh, you're going to get a little bit of wisdom about who these horses are and so on. All right? Let's go to prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for uh, this book. And it is, Lord, it, it is keeping us. It is holding on to us. It is doing things in us, Father, that we cannot do ourselves. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the power that these, this book, these words have in our lives. The influence, God, that these words, when they are freely spoken and people hear them and they believe them, they reason in their mind that these words are true and correct. Lord, it just opens up salvation for them. And Father, that's why we're here. That's why we do what we do, Lord. We ask you, God, to bless our efforts at showing the world the truth that is contained in this book. Bless it, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.